This is Bob Oliphant from the Westford Historical Society and Museum bringing you episode 35 of season two of the Westford Wardsman podcast. The Westford Wardsman newspaper was part of Turner's Public Spirit, a weekly newspaper in air a century ago. In this episode, we'll be reading the Wardsman for the week ending Saturday, August 28th, 1909. I'll elaborate on what was happening in Westford 114 years ago. Uh, This issue begins with the About the Town section, and the first paragraph is an advertisement uh, for one of um, Samuel Taylor's favorite organizations, I think. Ho, ye farmers, bear in mind that the Middlesex North Agricultural Society is still on earth and doing business with the earth, that horse racing, chasing, steeple climbing performance are no longer in it that the next fair will be held at Chelmsford Center September 15th and 16th. So get a move on your memory and save up some of the soil of your toil and help out the display of the day. Remember, Middlesex North has won out, paid its debts, and has a surplus with which to make a sort of tour of the world. It is liable to tour Westford right away. George W. Hill on the Cold Spring Road fell from a ladder last week while searching for apples and broke a rib. He acted as surgeon in setting the bone with a combination of Menard's liniment, butternut pills, lobelia, alcohol, and homemade skill. Um, Menard's liniment is an aromatic combination of camphor, ammonia water, and medicinal turpentine developed in the 1860s by a Nova Scotian a physician named Dr. Levi Menard, known as, quote, the king of pain, end quote. It is used for treating sore muscles and aching backs. It continues to be made by the Canadian company Stella Pharmaceutical, and you can find out more about it at www.menards.com. That's spelled M-I-N-A-R-D-S. Mrs. Quincy Day and her daughter, Miss May Day, Mrs. Jeanette Wright, and Mrs. Jenny Hildreth attended the camp meeting at Sterling last week and returned with varied sheaves of inspiration. Comrade Wesley O. Hawks and son Frank and selectman Andrew Johnson have returned from the GAR Salt Lake City expedition. Uh, The GAR is the Grand Army of the Republic. Uh, the the Veterans Association for Civil War Vets, and both Wesley Hawks and Andrew Johnson were veterans. Experiences floating on Salt Lake will preserve them good for a long while. Many are preparing to take in the auto races on the boulevard at Tingsboro and Lowell Labor Labor Day week. Be careful and don't get taken in the mile-a-minute rapids. A mile-a-minute is 60 miles per hour, which is pretty fast for 1909, and we'll read more about these races in a few weeks. The next section is called State Police Investigating. State police have been at Brookside during the past week looking up evidence in regard to the attempt to set fire to the barn of George W. Bussey. The evidence so far seems to indicate that it was not an act of ill will, but the freak of an insane person who once lived at Brookside and was arrested a few years ago for assault with a revolver and has since served time for assault with vitriol, that is uh, sulfuric acid. In Lowell. There is evidence to show that he, ha- he was seen in the vicinity of Brookside on the evening of the fire and afterwards seen hurrying towards North Chelmsford. If this proves to be the right party, charge the act up to opium. So they had a drug problem a hundred years ago. Mr. Bussey has interviewed the selectman, insurance agent, Captain Fletcher, and others in an attempt to prevent so much lawless fishing, lawless setting of fish fires, lawless harvesting of crops, lawless tramping generally. The writer had a profitable experience in lawless harvesting of crops. Between darkness and hurry and and hurry and digging a peck of potatoes, a dollar bill was dropped. Keep on, gentlemen, and harvest the whole field on that basis and brush right by trespass notices. You shall never go into court as long as your unintentional liberality continues. That Mr. Buzzy has been vexatiously annoyed in various ways, there is no room for doubt. Even the Lowell and Fitchburg Street Railway harvested his butternuts, don't you know? 
They harvested $125 worth with one bump of the car, but there have been many aggravating bumps in small slyways to make it seem justifiable to bump somebody against the law. Uh, the next section is baseball. Another of those Waterloo's for the Westford team at Fitchburg last Saturday, 12 to 1, just barely a run. A picked team, a good team, don't understand the why of it and don't want to think about it. But think of Nashua this afternoon. That is just where the real game of the, of the season is going to get a plane with the Westford team best three and five. So far, it is a case of the tangle, and this is to untie the tangle. The game last Saturday along the curved banks of the Stony Brook as it moistens the lily land of the talent farm was won by the Pelham team 2-1, to one, or increasing the dose 10-5. to five. The Pelham team was partly talented and the talent team, uh, the talent team is a capital T, it's a surname, was all talented. Under this combination, nature seems to be reversed, and the, may, and the more talents there are, the less ability. The next paragraph is called A Pleasant Gathering. One of those good, old-fashioned, hearty, wholesome, help-yourself gatherings was laid out and carried out with none of your begrudging, stingy bearers about it at the farm homestead of Charles W. Whitney on the Lowell Road last Sunday. Nearly two and one-half dozen people contributed to happiness as they talked, walked, read, ate watermelons, peaches, plums, poultry, and drank Massachusetts Standard Milk of the 12% Solidity brand. It certainly was as handsome a sight as any posy garden, this garden of hospitality and appreciative response. Mrs. Whitney, the mother of Charles W., who has been ill and under the care of Dr. Wells, is getting well and going right along as though 85 years were not so very much to lug about. The next section is the Westford Center section. Mrs. Alonzo H. Sutherland and family, Mrs. Nelson Tuttle and family, Mrs. Jocks and daughter Dorothy, Miss Grace Bennett and Miss Annie Blodgett, making 13 in all, went for a day's outing to Baptist Pond, South Chelmsford, Tuesday. Uh, Chelmsford First Baptist Church, established in 1771, lies just north of the pond, uh, now called Hart Pond, uh, at the junction of Maple and Acton Roads in South Chelmsford. This number, that is the 13 people in this trip, was unlucky only in number, for the weather was ideal and the day was full of enjoyment. There was boating on the pond and at noon a fine picnic dinner. This was supplemented with corn and potatoes roasted most successfully over an outdoor fire. The party drove home in the cool of the evening and voted it a most successful summer outing. Mrs. Mary E. Mitchell and Miss Sarah A. Pear of Cambridge, Mrs. Homer M. Seavey's mother and aunt, are visitors in the Seavey homestead. There is a set of photographs at the library from the Library Art Club illustrating the rise of sculpture. Many of the pictures are early Grecian, arranged in chronological order, and are particularly instructive and beautiful. Mrs. G.S. Cushing and daughter Marion of Medford were guests during last week at their cousins, Mrs. Ralph Bridgeford. Mrs. Eliza Carter and daughter Adrith have been enjoying a visit in Providence, Rhode Island, and Miss Ruby Carter has been visiting in Lowell. Mr. and Mrs. Albert Work Wilkinson and two little children of Methune have been spending the week with Mrs. Wilkinson's parents, Mr. and Mrs. William Sutherland. William A. Woodward, J. Herbert Fletcher, Aaron, and Alfred Tuttle went to Boston Wednesday and from there down the harbor for a day's deep sea fishing. The John P. Wrights are moving this week to their new home in Lowell, much to the regret of their many Westford friends. They have been most deservedly popular during the years they have been in town and take with them very sincere good wishes for happiness and prosperity in their new environment. Mr. and Mrs. Oscar R. Spaulding and Mrs. Frances B. Prescott are spending a week in Maine with headquarters at Portland, making various shorter trips from there. 
Town clerk Edward Fisher with Mrs. Fisher and baby Helen are having a well-earned vacation, spending part of the time at Mrs. Fisher's home in Swampscott and the rest at Camden, Maine. Mrs. Charles H. Wright, Miss Lu- M- Miss Edith A. Wright, Mrs. Frank C. Hildreth, Mrs. Quincy Day, and Miss May Day have returned from an enjoyable time at Sterling Junction Campgrounds. The single service at the Congregational Church Sunday evening was well sustained and was conducted by Houghton G. Osgood, the subject being the lessons from prayer. Mr. Marshall, the church pa- church's pastor, will have returned from his vacation and the morning service will be resumed the first Sunday in September. At the next meeting of the Grange, Thursday evening, September 2nd, the evening's program was to have been a lecture by Edward Howe Forbush, state ornithologist and also author of Birds of New England, published in 1929, the same year that Forbush died, and a very popular uh, New England bird book. The Grange lecturer has received word that Mr. Forbush cannot come until the first meeting in November, and the program for these two meetings will be reversed. The material for next Thursday evening will be of special interest to the sisters. There will be a discussion of the following topic. Should there be a system of housekeeping and and papers on the subjects, sunny side of farm life and things worthwhile for the farmer's wife? With the advent of cooler evenings, a good attendance and a ready participation in the session is desired. Only a little more than a week more and the fall term of the schools will open. Both the Academy and the William E. Frost School are receiving a thorough cleaning ready for the reopening. The teaching force at the Academy has William A. Woodward at the head with Miss Edith Babbitt of Fitchburg and the new teacher who takes Miss Bartlett's place is Miss Lawrence from Campello, which is a village in Brockton, Mass. Miss Bartlett, who is pleasantly remembered, goes to Exeter to teach. At the Frost School, Miss Fisher is the principal, and Miss Cushing and Miss Grant return the same as last year, and Miss Burnham of Essex takes Miss Platt's place. Mr. and Mrs. Alford and daughter Molly of Arlington have been spending a week with Dr. and Mrs. Wells. Miss Alice Howard has been entertaining a number of classmates from Simmons College at her home. Miss Ruth Fisher has been spending a week at Southbridge. Miss Clara Fisher is spending the month of August at Harpswell, Maine. The John Fishers are at the Birches, uh, the name of their cottage, at Forge Pond. The next section is Graniteville. Charles Martin of West Chelmsford and Miss Mary T. Dunn of Dracut have been recent visitors in the village. And then there's a long paragraph on the, entitled The Annual Picnic. The annual picnic given under the auspices of the parishioners of St. Catherine's Church was held at Hillside Park, this village, on last Saturday afternoon, and a large number were in attendance. The many people from out of town took advantage of the fine weather conditions and joined the merry throng in which the time was spent very pleasantly in reviewing old friendships and taking in the many attractions on the grounds. The first sporting event was the baseball game between the Brookside Club and the Graniteville Blues, as the local club was very anxious to maintain its standing as the leader in the Stony Brook League, and the Brooksides were equally desirous of getting out of last place. The result was a finely played game, and that was finished in less than one hour and 30 minutes, in which the Graniteville Blues won by the score of 4-2. to two. Ripley pitched a fine game for the visitors, the few hits that the locals made of him coming in at just the proper time to score runs. Flodden, F-L-O-D-I-N, in left field played a good, consistent game, his fielding being, being a big factor in keeping the score down for the opposing team. Pope and Swanson also did good work. For the locals, the battery work of McCarthy and Ledwith was all to the good. Tom keeping the hits well scattered, while Bill nailed every man that attempted to steal second, besides getting in his customary two-bagger. The fielding of Defoe was as usual up to a high standard, he pulling down several difficult high ones that were labeled for extra basis. 
Buckingham showed that he had his eye with him by finding the ball for two pretty bingles. And just as the period of the game, at the period of the game, when runs were very much needed. Uh, uh, I might interject that some of you may remember Willis Bucky Buckingham, who died in 2018. This Buckingham was either his father or one of the his uncles. I, I remember talking to Bucky about them. The rest of the boys played good, fast baseball and, taken on the whole, the game proved to be highly interesting. The Brookside boys are a fine bunch of fellows, and although the locals felt it their duty to win, the visitors showed the proper sporting spirit by being good losers, and the best of feelings prevailed throughout. After the ball game, the other sports were run off with the following results. 100 yards open, Pope first, led with second. Hop, step, and jump, Will Wright first, 36 feet, 11 inches, Pope second. Broad jump, Edward Riney first, 8 feet, 8 and a half inches, Flood in second. Boys race, Gower first, Gagnon second. The flower race followed in which 25 small boys struggled for pennies and nickels that were placed in a bag of flour dumped on the ground, and it was found very hard to pick a winner as several of the boys were seen fishing, in quotes, while the crowd were eating supper. This ended the sports, and the time was taken up visiting the side attractions. The cane stand in charge of Will Wall, Joe Riney, and Ed Riney did a rushing business. The fishing pond in charge of the young ladies was also well patronized, and at 5.30 o'clock, an excellent supper in charge of the ladies of the parish was served under the trees. Mr. and Mrs. Arthur, Arthur Marcione had charge of the tonic and were kept busy, while cigars, peanuts, potato chips, and ice cream found ready sales throughout the afternoon. Reverend J.J. McNamara was present during the afternoon and took a deep interest in all that was going on. In the evening, a social dance was held in Healy's Hall. The Imperial Orchestra of Groton, U.H. Barrow's director, furnished excellent music for dancing, and at intermission, refreshments were served in the lower hall. The dance was very largely attended, many being present from out of town. The whole affair was a great social and financial success and reflects great credit on the committee in charge. The next paragraph is just entitled, Death. Mrs. Marie Lefebvre Milo, wife of Joseph Milo, died at her home in this village after a brief illness on Saturday morning, August 21st, aged 62 years. Besides her husband, she leaves six sons, Arthur, Come, Donat, Dennis, Idolan, Syriac, and two daughters, Eduardina and Alphonsine. The deceased had a wide circle of relatives and friends in this vicinity that sincerely mourn her loss. The funeral took place on last Monday morning at 8 o'clock and was largely attended. At 8.30, a funeral mass was celebrated in St. Catherine's Church, the pastor, Reverend Edmund J. Schofield, being the officiating clergyman. The choir, under the direction of Miss Mary F. Hanley, sang the Gregorian chant. There were many beautiful floral offerings. The bearers were the five sons, and son-in-law, Philip Canton. Burial was in St. Catherine Cemetery, this village. Next is the Forge Village section. The Ladies' Sewing Circle of St. Andrew's Mission held a very successful bean supper at Re Recreation Hall on Wednesday evening, August 18th. The supper was served from 6.30 until 8. A large number was present, including many of the summer friends who are sojourning on the shores of Forge Pond. All did ample justice to the tempting array of the good things set out before them. Reverend T. L. Fisher, pastor of the church, and Paul Roberts of Ayer were among the out-of-town guests. After supper, a social hour with dancing was passed. A very pleasing incident occurred during the evening when Mr. Fisher announced the kind friend who loaned the money to build the sheds for the mission. It was with pleasure we found it was William Burnett, who has worked for the building of the society long and well. He was uh, one of the residents in Forge Village, I believe. Henry Story of Hudson is spending his vacation with his brother, R.D. Prescott. 
A very pretty home wedding took place Wednesday afternoon when George Weaver, only son of Mr. and Mrs. William Weaver, and Miss Jessie Wilson were united in marriage at the parental home of Miss Wilson. Reverend Mr. Matthews of Lowell was the officiating clergyman. The bride was attired in white liberty satin. Her sister, Miss Lena Wilson, attended her while Walter Precious was best man. There were many neighbors and friends present, and the many and beautiful present show the esteem in which the young people were held. The Forge Village Lions were defeated by the West Chelmsford team on the home grounds Saturday afternoon, score 7-4. to four. A large number of people from the village and West Chelmsford were present. Mr. and Mrs. Charles Blodgett welcomed a little daughter to their home, the Ridges, August 19th. Mrs. Blodgett was formerly Miss Bessie Lees of this village. Mr. and Mrs. John Baker also welcomed a little daughter, Marjorie L. Baker, August 24th. John Edwards is very ill, but at the time of writing seems a little better. Mrs. Catchpole gains very slowly. That's the news in Westford for the week ending August 28th, 1909. Thank you for listening. And thanks to Nick Woodbury of Westford Cat for uh, providing technical support. You can find transcriptions and podcasts from the Wardsman at our website at museum.westford.org or visit the Historical Society's Facebook page for more Westford news from a century ago. This is Bob Oliphant, and hope you will join us for next week's Westford Wardsman podcast. Thank you.